begun. Yes, it does. All right. And so, I mean, I actually, I didn't ask the most important question. Do you usually do an introduction or do I introduce yes, myself? I <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we are live. Everybody, welcome. Uh, we are starting a new series of talks, of videos, uh, live to Facebook, live to many other platforms, where SmartMove 360 invites our experts to talk on a topic that they're experts on. So today we will have our first expert, Louis Bertus. He is PA and he will be talking about how you can be eating to in order to reverse your insulin resistance. Warning or like pay attention those who are trying to go whole food, plant-based, this is actually maybe for you a life-changing experience and for others um, another way to look at this um, way of structuring your uh, menu so let's go Louis. welcome and stage is yours all right thank you irena and again if, of course it's my honor uh to be invited to share on something that's really close to my heart something i'm very passionate about um, and I know can help a lot of people. Um, so if you're watching this uh, playback or watching this live, uh, make sure you take notes, pay attention, because whether or not you are a diabetic or um, what, what type of diabetes you have, type one or type two, or even pre-diabetes, you could benefit from this information. So um, I'm going to switch over to my, my slide and, and give you a little information about myself. So the title of this presentation is Eating to Reverse Insulin Resistance. Um, and I guess the subtitle can be The Fat Connection. So I titled that the fat, the fat Connection because a lot of times we don't really pay attention to this part of diabetes. Um, a lot of carbs is center stage when it comes to diabetes. We're all worried about uh, the carbs. But uh, this presentation is going to highlight the fat connection um, and it's not something new, it's something that's very old, the, the connection between fat and insulin resistance. And of course, once you understand this, you'll know how to eat um, to reverse the, the disease process. So just a little background of who I am. I, uh, it's already been said, I'm a physician assistant. Um, I actually started my uh, education in theology as a, my bachelor's is, is uh, in theology at Southern Adventist University where I graduated. I was uh, at one time, actually planning on being a, a, a pastor. So, um, and uh, there's a lot of people ask me, well, how do you go from studying theology and you know going on route to be a, a pastor to a physician assistant? But to me, I don't I don't think they're unrelated because Jesus was a was considered the great physician, right? And so I've always felt a, a passion to help people in a very practical way. Uh, just like uh, Jesus did. So that's what led me to uh, get my master's in a physician assistant studies. Um, for anybody who knows about the Seventh Day Adventist Church, which I am a member of, uh, it's a church that is very into health and holistic um, medicine and lifestyle. So it wasn't a big jump for me to really understand that lifestyle holds the key to reverse almost all chronic diseases. So uh, when my wife was diagnosed with diabetes uh, about eight years ago, of course, um, it was a shock to us. But uh, the good thing is we, were, we we knew what to do, at least as far as where to look. And so we started looking at uh, the plant-based option of, of, of what, we, what you know as vegetarian or vegan diets for diabetes. And it took some time. It took a long time to find the right um science behind in a diabetes reversal because that's what we wanted to do we wanted to reverse my wife's diabetes and she had all the complications of diabetes uh were, were starting to develop and she tried various lifestyles various diets you know even vegetarian and vegan didn't work it wasn't until we understood the fat connection the fact that even as a vegan or vegetarian you can have too much fat in your diet 
And when we addressed that problem, it took six weeks and she was off medicine. So um, since then, you know, I've been passionate about teaching. I actually have a um, health coaching program that I do as well. And so I coach people who are diabetics to come off medication and even uh, go back to undiabetic numbers, or I have to say normal numbers for their blood sugar, reversing the disease with this approach. It is powerful. Um, it is effective. And if you understand the science behind it, it just makes sense. All right. So uh, that is who I am. And this is what we will cover. So we're going to cover the biochemistry of the disease. What is insulin resistance, right? It's a complicated, complex process, but we're going to dumb it down because I always like to say I hate things that are complicated. So we're going to dumb it down. We're going to dumb down the biochemistry of the disease. Uh, we're also going to talk about past and modern treatment approaches. Uh, we're actually, I should say, we're, we're, we're going to focus more on modern treatment approaches, but, and then we're going to talk about what you came here for, how to heal using food as medicine, how to eat to reverse insulin resistance, uh, which happens again in type one diabetics, type two diabetics and non-diabetics. So everybody can benefit from reversing insulin resistance in the body. Uh, so th there's a lot we'll cover, right? And I'm going to try to move at a, no, uh, at a good pace. So I hope you can keep up, but I know I, I, I only have about 40 to 45 minutes. So uh, we're going to be moving pretty fast. All right. So uh, diabetes is an old disease, but a new problem. Okay. We've for centuries have known this disease existed. There's, there's text and manuscripts from even ancient Egypt that talks about diabetes. And people are pretty surprised when they learn that. Uh, it's been around for a while. However, it was only until the 1940s, 1950s that we started to see a rise, or I should say a change in what type of diabetics became common. So in the past, it was type 1 diabetics. If you heard about diabetes in the you know, 1800s or past, you know, then you would hear you, they were more likely a, a, than not a type 1 diabetic. Now, if you have diabetes, almost everybody is a type 2 diabetic. OK, and this is what's interesting. You could see from 1950s onward the, the, the rise in the rates of diabetes in the United States and, of course, in the world. The percentage and number of diabetics, type 2 diabetics, um, became a new problem of an old disease. So what correlates with this and it makes sense that this happened because during that time frame, the 1950s and, and late 40s, there was a change in our food. In the late 19th and 20th century, you know, uh, there was no food labels, no lengthy ingredients to our food, but food changed when war came, right? Um, so because meats, meat, fats, dairy, and sugars were in limited supply in the, the 1940s, eating included a lot more fruits and vegetables than we eat in modern times, right? Uh, it wasn't just meat and potatoes. It was farm, whole foods, whole plant-based foods was majority of Americans' diets. Of course, then Great Depression and the World War came, food scarcity, malnutrition, mass starvation became common problems. You know, we were dealing with rickets and scurvy. And so we had to fall, find a way to make food cheaper and quicker to combat these real problems. And so we did. We The, the, the governments and the nations of our world came together and they came up with uh, really good uh, solutions like factory farming. So we can make, you know, uh, food from f farm to, to, your, to your table a lot faster. Um, we started process processing and fortifying foods with minerals and preservatives to make sure that it lasts longer on the shelf, right? Um, so this way we were trying to, to combat food scarcity, malnutrition, and mass starvation, real problems. We were facing optimal nutrition versus survival. It wasn't about giving the people the best foods. It was giving them food to survive. Understand the difference, right? Optimal nutrition versus survival. You're going to choose survival every day, right? If you have to choose one or the other. The problem is today we deal with different problems. Right. We're not dealing with survival or mass starvation on a worldwide scale. We are dealing with diabetes, heart disease and chronic illness. Two other uh, two, um, I say three big offsets of another problem. 
And if I were to fill in the question mark, <laughs> um, it's going to get a little controversial. But the real problem we face with today is not mass starvation or, or survival. It's the fact that making money this way makes a lot of making sorry making food this way makes a lot of money. <laughs> um, corporations and food companies they they pocket billions of dollars to keep the food coming as fast and as convenient as possible. So uh, it doesn't really, optimal nutrition isn't as important to some as making sure the, may, they meet their bottom line. So we can see that during the time frame of course, in, in, uh, as the centuries went on, um, there was a lot of changes in what Americans eat, right? And it was reflected, that's also reflected in our day. And one of the biggest changes is that we started eating a lot more meat and animal products. Um, you can see from the 1940s here to 1950s, that's when it started to spike, right? That was because of all the factory farming and the and the the how quick it was to bring food from farm to table. It's there was a massive rise in meat consumption. Now, do you remember the last chart we looked at a couple of slides back? 1950s, 1940s was the same time we started to see a rise in what? A rise in diabetes, correct? So um, going forward, you know, now we have not just rickets and scurvy diseases of malnutrition, we have diseases of overnutrition. Right. So we have my rent and diabetes is one of the prime examples of 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 diseases of overnutrition. Um, and it's a disease that 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 affects every part of our body from our head to our feet. Right. And you can see in this chart, it talks about the it shows the various things that are affected by diabetes. OK. And uh, another thing that is interesting to note is the difference between um, visceral fat and subcutaneous fat and understanding this uh the difference and the type of obesity we understand a little bit about the disease uh insulin resistance that happens to us all now if you look at the two you know subcutaneous fat or visceral fat a lot of us don't want the subcutaneous fat because the subcutaneous fat is a fat you can see right that's a fat that's lying under your skin um and it's unsightly for 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 some so they want to get rid of that fat but the more dangerous fat is not the subcutaneous fat. The more dangerous fat is a fat that lies within and around your internal organs. This fat, as we'll see in, in, in future slides, is the real cause of chronic illness um, and metabolic syndrome and diabetes. And it's so powerful that when someone goes through, um, let's say, liposuction, right? Let's let's compare two surgeries. If you have liposuction, you're removing the subcutaneous fat, you're still going to be diabetic. You're still going to have high blood pressure. However, when someone goes through uh, bariatric surgery, right, and the way it works, you start to lose your visceral fat very fast because bariatric surgery actually affects how much fat your body absorbs. Most of the fat you eat actually exits your intestines. It's not absorbed after, bari after bariatric surgery. So your visceral fat drops. And guess what? In just weeks, sometimes days, di uh, you become um, you can reverse your diabetes. You're healed from diabetes after getting rid of this visceral fat through bariatric surgery. So of course, we could end the slide here. The presentation is over. Just go and get go and get bariatric surgery, and that'll solve all your problem, right? Obviously, no. That's not what you want. Nobody wants. <laughs> I mean, obviously, if 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 you qualify for it and and it's an option for you, great. But that's not an option for some of us. So we got to go forward and learn how to eat to reverse this process if we're not going under the knife. Um, so this is another um, chart that kind of highlights the importance of, of visceral fat because the more visceral fat you have, you tend to have more weight around your waist. Another thing I should say this because a lot of people say, well, I'm not fat, you know, I'm, I'm skinny and I have diabetes. You, the problem is you don't see the fat that's inside your organs and around your organs. So you could be thin and still di be, be diabetic or eating your way towards diabetes. So your weight isn't the prime indicator of this disease happening right in your body but that waist to height ratio is a good indicator of health so um this is something very interesting if you look at this chart it's it shows that 
as your waist to height ratio goes up, right? The, the difference between your waist and your height circumference increases, your years of life decrease. I mean, just stop and think about that. It's not good. It's not good news for some of us. So it just shows you the, the, the powerful effect of, of this visceral fat, this internal fat in our organs. And when it comes to longevity and, and, and living, living uh, to our, our fullest, right? Uh, but weight loss is hard. You know, uh, we, we try to make it seem easy and you've all heard, you know, that you just got to eat less and move more. That's your real problem, right? If you want to get rid of that, that visceral fat, that internal fat inside, you know, or just get to a ideal body weight, then just exercise more and eat less. But we know this doesn't work, right? Um, there's a couple of reasons. One reason is because of the BMR or basal metabolic rate, the rate at which your body is burning fat can adjust and, and actually decrease based on your activity level and food intake. So your body has a mean way of trying to hold on to fat as much as it can. So when you start to starve yourself, it goes into survival mode and starts conserving energy. It starts to decrease the, the uh, bar um, when it comes to how much it takes to start to uh, lose weight. And so it can really be hard to lose weight just on diet and exercise alone. Um, there's this, there's a study called Women's Health Initiative where 50,000 women went on a 342 calorie diet deficit on average, and they increased the exercise by 10%. And you would think, okay, they're eating more, I'm sorry, they're eating less and moving more, and they should have lost weight. But over seven years, there was virtually no weight loss. No weight loss during that time. Um, and this is because, and this is where we're getting a little closer to the topic, the role of ins that insulin plays um, in our bodies. R the insulin's, insulin's job is to determine food energy destination. Insulin has a lot of jobs, right? He's, he's a workhorse. This little guy does a lot in your body. But one of the main jobs that, um, that it does is to determine where food energy goes, right? And we're going to break this down and, and understand what happens when your body and how your body can be resistant to this little guy. Um, so let's talk about the basics of insulin. So first it starts with what you eat, right? When you eat food, whether it be bread, meat or margarine, you know, um, whatever the food source is, your body wants to break down into simple energy units, right? Your body wants to use that energy, but it has to use that food for energy, but it has to digest it first and distribute it throughout the, the cells of your body. So that you have glucose as an energy unit, you have amino acids from protein as an energy unit, and you also have fatty acids as an energy unit from uh, fat sources. Now, of course, uh, most of us know that the ideal energy unit is glucose. The, the, unit, the, the form of energy that your body uh, works the best at at using for energy is glucose. And so glucose, it can be used by every part of our body to give us energy. And you can see this, your brain can use glucose, your lungs, your heart, your liver, pancreas, everything can use glucose for energy. So it becomes a primary source for, for energy. Glucose is very important. So insulin's job is to escort glucose into the cell. It, it, it basically, as you've probably heard before, knocks on the door and says, hey, cell, we got glucose in the blood. Can you let him in so that it can get, and get in and provide energy? And the cell opens its doors and glucose goes in. This is what happens in a healthy body. Now, um, another thing that can happen inside that cell is that insulin once in, and with the, can actually take that extra gl that glucose and store it for energy for later use. The stored energy is glycogen. So glu when glucose is stored for en stored for energy for later use, it's stored in the form of glycogen, right? And we're going to describe this in a, in a couple ways. Another thing that insulin does is it can take some of that extra glucose energy and actually can transfer it in, in, into fat so that you can have 
and more energy for later down later down the line when glucose is not so available. So your body can store that food energy as glycogen. It can store it as fat. And um, another analogy I really love is like, let's say you have a log and you chop that log up into little pieces. You have two options. You could burn the log in the fire for energy right now, or you could stock stack the logs for later. That's what glucose, or sorry, that's what glycogen is. It's the stack of logs that your body's going to use to burn up for energy later. So now I want to give uh, a really simple illustration. Um, it's very basic, but it's something that we all uh, go through in life. So I know can make a lot of sense. Um, sorry, I think this was supposed to show up a little different. Anyway, so you're, you, when you go to the supermarket and you're going for food, Let's say you pick up your favorite food items and you head your your head you head home and you're hungry. The first thing that your body wants to do is eat because you are hungry. Okay, and so you eat some of that food and then you decide to put the rest of the food in the fridge. Whatever can fit in the fridge, you put it in the fridge. Whatever can't put fit in the fridge, you put in your freezer. Right, and that food is for later use whenever uh, you need it. The same thing happens in your body. This illustration, um, I really like it because it makes sense because all of us go to the store at some time or the other, right? Um, so you, when you eat food energy, insulin's job is to determine where that food is put away. Insulin can take some of that food and feed your hungry body cells because your cells need to eat now. Your cells are like little babies crying, saying, hey, don't you better feed me now. Don't be putting that food away. Right. So your cells eat some of that food energy. Right now, insulin's next job is to take some of that food energy and put it away for later use. One of the forms that puts it away, you already learned, is in the fridge or glycogen. Right. Glycogen storage is mainly found in two places your liver and your muscle tissues. And inside these compartments, right, your, your body is very good at storing energy for later. Now, what happens when the fridge is full, when your glycogen storage is starting to get, get full, insulin can take the extra glucose energy and turn it into fat, right? So it could take some of that food energy, whether it be and this is this is not just glucose. It could also do the same with fat and 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 protein or amino acids. They all can be transferred into fat storage or your freezer space for later use. Now, if uh, you go a long time without eating, your insulin levels will drop, and that's a good thing because you don't want insulin just swimming around your blood at all times. Right, it only it only it only comes out to play when it's necessary. So in between meals, your body drops a little lower on insulin, and let's say you go a little longer. Let's say you're going, you're practicing intermittent fasting, which this is why one of the best ways to to make your sense your insulin sensitivity go up is fasting. So let's say you're fasted for 16, 24 hours, you really haven't eaten. What's going to happen now is your refrigerator is opening up. And some of that food energy in the fridge is go is going to feed the cells. This is good, right? So your your liver and your muscle tissues are opening up their storage of glycogen, and they're feeding the hungry body cells when you're fasting. Because guess what? Insulin's not around, right? When insulin drops, one of the things insulin the drop of insulin does is that it, it communicates to the liver, hey, it's time to release some stored energy, right? Um, when you go for a very long time of fasting, you could also start burning fat for energy because, of course, it, as your refrigerator is getting low, your body says, let's start opening up the freezer. What do we equate the freezer to? Fat. Fat storage is that long-term energy, right? So it says, well, let's let's conserve some of this fridge uh, energy in our liver and let's start using the energy in our freezer space, right? Our fat starts to feed our cells. So this is what happens in a healthy person. Now what happens when you are insulin resistant? This process doesn't happen overnight. It can happen 
and for years before you become a full-blown diabetic. It could also happen with someone who, who is a type one diabetic. So what happens when you eat food and now you've become insulin resistant? And this is just more of an explanation of what it is. We're going to go into how it happens. But um, insulin resistance happens when insulin, like a key, comes to unlock the door or knock on the door of the cell and the cell won't let insulin work. The cell has now become body-wide resistant to insulin. And so you know what happens when insulin resistance is high enough and goes on long enough, blood sugar rises and glucose gets trapped in the blood. So this process actually leads to a very vicious cycle. And if you look at this graphic, this graphic, I got credit to Mastering Diabetes book, um, a book that I definitely highly recommend, awesome um, authors, uh, and really explain the, I, the idea of insulin resistance well, uh, these pictures here. So in step one of insulin resistance, insulin is trying to get through a wall, right? It's trying to bust through a wall to let the little glucose <laughs> uh, energy units into the cell, right? But this body has become resistant to insulin's um, effects. So glucose is impatient, it's getting trapped in the blood, it's asking how do we get inside the cell? What is happening? Well, the good thing is the body has a reflex mechanism to increase the chance that glucose can get inside the cell. And what it does is very simple. It says, well, if a little bit of insulin won't do the job, let's start producing more insulin. So your pancreas goes into overdrive and starts to increase the amount of insulin flowing through the blood. Now, instead of a little knock on the door, it becomes a cannonball to bust that hole through the wall and let blood sugar into the cell. Now, there is a problem here. If you remember and you, and you understand what insulin does when it's present in the blood, and especially if it does this in excess, now you've got more fat storage because as insulin rises because of insulin resistance it has to you have more of this workhorse right this little guy becomes an army of <laughs> that is forcing food energy inside an already overstuffed liver inside an already overstuffed muscle and inside already overstuffed lipid droplets and adipose tissue or fatty tissue that's all over your body. The floating insulin starts to force energy inside the cell. Now, the good thing is the, the glycogen storage is limited, right? There's only so much pl place where glucose can be stored in the form of, uh, of glycogen, right? In your muscle and your liver. However, as you well know, you could find fat wherever you need it to go. <laughs> so insulin says, well, the fridge is full. Let's start stacking up freezer space. And so it starts to develop an, an overdrive and excess storage of fat in tissues that were never designed to, to store a large amount of fat. So understand this, the glycogen is limited. The fat to an extent is almost unlimited. And that's where you become, you get the problem. So now the body is like, the cells are like, stop insulin. We got enough energy. We've got enough fat inside these, these cells to use for energy. So now you can take your glucose and go. And over, over and this continues to happen. Eventually, now you prick your finger and your blood sugar is 400. And you think this happened overnight, but no, this process you've been eating your, your way towards and no judgment to anyone because we all are living the same lifestyle here in America and unfortunately a lot, or, or in a lot of places in the world <clears throat> where eventually now you're a diabetic. Um, so what caused it? Um, simple is really simple while refined carbs do play a role we must understand the primary cause is a diet that is too high in fats right so we 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 often point the finger at carbs but the problem the primary cause of insulin resistance which again happens in all types of diabetes is a diet that is too high in fat making it very hard to undo the problem of fat storage, okay? Um, 
I know this is a lot of information. I only got about 10 or 15 minutes before we open up to, to uh, questions, but I want to pause and say that, you know, we will have plenty of opportunity to go more in detail in the future, in future uh, lives um, and lectures, okay? But uh, we're just kind of staying surface level right now. The fat connection is nothing new, however. The fat connection is something that's been known for a long time, for uh, over 100 years at this point. As early as 1920, research published the damaging effects of high fat diets on insulin function. This is nothing new. In 1950s, Dr. Walter Kemper reversed type 2 diabetes, how? With a low fat diet. Um, 1970, James um, Anderson reduced or eliminated insulin with low fat, high fiber diets. And even today, people, practitioners like myself, or uh, you probably heard of Neil Bonnard or uh, Dean Ornish, they, that promotes the whole food plant-based lifestyle for, if, if not no other reason, for its effect to reverse diabetes. It's very powerful and very possible uh, to do that when you're on a low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet and it's been it's been done for years it's nothing new um in 1927 dr shirley sweeney demonstrates how insulin function can be compromised by a high fat diet so 1927 this was a really simple experiment where they took a, a group of of a college student i'm sorry medical students and they decided to experiment how insulin function can be compromised with a high fat diet what they did was very simple for two days, they put this group of healthy males on one of four diets. So, you know, of course, they weren't diabetic, but which actually I think gives it even more credence that, you know, to show how how effective, I should say, how um, how powerful this effect is uh, when you're when you have too much fat. So they put them on a, a number of types of diets. No, three of those diets were a high protein, a high fat, and a high carb diet. The high protein diet, uh, that group had something like lean meats, egg whites, you know, um, just uh, emphasizing protein in their diet. And they ate that for two days. The other group had a lot of fat in their diet for two days. So they ate things like oil and butter and mayonnaise and cream, right? And so things that were very fatty, they ate for two days straight. And then there was a third group, a high carb group. And this group ate things like white sugar, white bread, pastries, candy, you know, and uh, all the things that a diabetic is told they shouldn't eat, right? And they shouldn't, okay? But it's interesting to see what happens after a glucose challenge. So all three groups were put to the test to see how they, after drinking, if anyone, if maybe you don't know what a glucose challenge is. So a glucose challenge is basically drinking, I think it's about 50 grams of a very sugary uh, 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 drink. And then within uh, certain interv intervals, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, you're checking your blood sugar to see how much it rises. So all th three groups did this challenge on the third day, and it was the high fat group that had the highest blood sugar level, not the high carb group. The high carb group was actually normal. And again, understanding they're not diabetic, but you can see how if we continually eating diets that are higher in fat, eventually your body, your system gives in and your insulin gets tired of being rejected, right? Your pancreas gives up and you become diabetic. It's a high fat diet that can be induced, that induces insulin resistance. And I should also say that and there are they when, when scientists want to induce insulin resistance in lab rats, guess what they do? They put them on a high fat diet, not a high carb diet. They put them on a high fat diet to experiment the effect of insulin resistance. So the fat connection continues. Um, the so, and there's a, a something called the felt the Randall cycle, uh, which was understood in 1963 to really explain the why we can't burn fat and glucose at the same time. See, fat and glucose are mutually exclusive energy units. So your cell is either prompt prioritizing fat for energy or it's prioritizing glucose for energy, it can't prioritize both at the same time. So when there's too much fat inside a cell, glucose becomes deprioritized and those insulin receptors shut down. And that's what becomes a problem. Fat blocks insulin from working. This keeps glucose trapped in the blood. And in essence, and very to keep it simple, 
high fat diets cause insulin resistance. So what causes insulin resistance? The insulin resistance and, uh, uh, is caused by the excess accumulation of fat in tissues not designed to store fat in large amounts. If you get nothing else from this presentation, understand this, I'll read it again. The excess accumulation of fat in tissues not designed to store fat in large amounts. And this is the tissues all over our body. All right, and I gotta move a little quicker because I know we got a few more slides left. Insulin resistance can actually be measured in the liver. And as the amount of fat in your liver increases, your sensitivity to insulin decreases inversely, right? Um, again, we show how powerful this effect is as the body has now exposed itself to so much insulin that it's bulldozing the, the, wall, the wall to get glucose in. Now the body has to revert um, up it up the ante a little bit and start to revert, to become more and more resistant because it says no insulin the cannonball is on its way let's start building that wall even stronger so now next time the wall stronger right they say quick hide insulin's in the blood we gotta we gotta stop it from from busting the wall down and but insulin keeps on rising insulin keeps on rising until it converts that extra glucose to fat it starts to feed those already full adipose tissues and they get larger and larger and this is a vicious cycle you eat food you make insulin your cells become resistant to insulin this causes you to make more insulin which causes you to store more fat and because you're resistant to insulin we're not going to go into the science of this too much your body feels hungry and tired because it can't recognize insulin and so you eat more food which you're eating because you're hungry and you make more insulin and the cycle goes on and on and on for years. And step by step, we'll go through this quickly. Fat enters your blood before glucose. This is another reason why that it's uh, it's e very easy to develop insulin resistance because unlike glucose, fat can actually enter your blood a lot quicker um, because it's picked up in the lymph system. And so, you know, before it even gets in, as it goes through intestines, your lymph, lymph system picks it up and starts transporting it throughout the body. Fat can also enter tissues without insulin where glucose cannot right? So fat can just, you know, uh, pass that, that, that membrane and go right into the cell. Um, we know again, that fatty, fatty tissue is everywhere. <laughs> Unlike where glycogen is only in limited places, fat is everywhere. Um, and over time, this, this fatty tissue or what we call adipose tissue can become inflamed. When it gets full, it gets so full that it starts to swell and until it bursts. And as it bursts, it causes body-wide inflammation. And we know that inflammation body-wide can lead to insulin resistance. And don't pay too much attention to that fat guy because it's not just people who are overweight, even people who are normal weight can have this happening in their body. It doesn't discriminate. Um, fat causes insulin resistance in muscle and liver tissues. Again, we understand because of the, 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 the Randall cycle. And then this is where step six, things get really um, a serious as the beta cells, the cells in your pancreas can also get stuffed with fat and become overworked, overwhelmed. And they actually, what they call it is interesting. They commit suicide. Beta cell suicide is a nickname for it. Over time, your, 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 the cells in your pancreas that can produce insulin start to decrease. It can decrease to as much as 25% use, you know, and you start seeing that you need more and more medicine, more and more insulin. Um, and in order to keep a normal blood sugar level. So, um, is all fat bad? I want us to understand something. You need fat. Some people hear, you know, uh, this presentation sometimes, and they might say to themselves, "Yeah, but uh, uh, Mr. Lewis said well, I can't eat any fat." That's not what I said. All fat is not bad. You need fat. Your body is a it's a necessary hormone for survival, and um, sorry, uh, nutrient for survival, and it has many effects in the body that are good. But what you need to do ideally is in, to, in order to reverse the disease of insulin resistance and by extension diabetes you ideally need to keep your fat percentage to 10 percent or at least no greater than 15 percent of your total calories current recommendations for fat percentage i believe are around 30 percent but if you want to reverse this disease you got to get down to as low as 10 to 15 percent 
and, and, and decreasing your, your consumption of dietary fat. Another thing that you do want to do is replace your saturated fat with plant-based unsaturated fat. I know we didn't describe that too much in this lecture, but we can in future lectures. But by replacing saturated fat with unsaturated fat and making sure that unsaturated fat also is kept within just 10 to 15 percent of your total daily calories, you can start reversing that extra, extra fat storage. And like I said, many of my clients, my wife included, are off medicine in weeks. So to do this, you can use Lose It app. There's a that's an app that I use with my clients. Um, very effective, very very helpful uh, way to kind of track your fat percentage. Um, and what's great is like you get to the point where you don't need it anymore, right? And you're eating carbs without limit, you know, because you know how to keep your fat low. Or if you don't like using Lose It, just use this simple principle in this what I call the traffic light system. Um, and let me just keep it simple. If you eat whole food, plant-based, you're already eliminating animal products and saturated and, and saturated fat is found in animal products. That's that's the main source of saturated fat, meat, dairy, eggs, and cheese, yes, and fish. If you limit those things and eat more whole food, plant-based, you're naturally eating a diet that's most likely close to 10 to 15%. If you're still struggling, then start looking at the yellow, yellow region of foods because the yellow eye foods might be your problem. You may have too much oil, plant oils, which is something you should get rid of and start using alternatives like vegetable broth. Maybe you have too much nuts or avocado, you know, healthy, healthy fats, but if there are too much of them, they also will make it harder or take a lot longer for that excess fat storage to start to go down, those freezers to start to drop in, in use. So um, in closing, uh, my contact information is on the screen. I believe they're also in the show notes. Um, but you could find me at uh, my uh, lewisburtis.com. My email address is simple, lewis at lewisburtis.com. Like I said, I like to keep things simple. I'm not lying about that. And uh, you could have an opportunity for free health coaching consultations by contacting me. Um, and also today we're giving away over 280 free whole food, plant-based delicious recipes. And if you'd like uh, that traffic light printout that was in the previous screen, you can reach out for me, reach out to me for that too. And that's all the time we got. Thank and so you, at this Luis. time, let's get this questions. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let's have this this way. Um, the, the questions we have here, let me pull it up. Uh, one I've seen that you might have a good answer okay for. let's see what does that say in the last dozen years most chain grocery stores have added vegetarian meat substitutes I often wonder when that will be the only option when bird flu or mad cow wipes out our hearts again um now yeah very interesting question for sure now i do that's a, that's something that's worth um considering is vegetarian meats an option now should we get these you know alternative meats yes and no See, if you're transitioning to a whole food plant-based, it might be good to use these as alternatives to transition. However, even those foods can have a lot of fat in them, right? So even those plant processed foods are, and that's why I emphasize whole food plant-based, not vegan or vegetarian, because whole food plant-based tells you what you should be in eating, whereas vegan vegetarian tells you what not to eat. Don't focus what you shouldn't eat. Focus on what you should increase. That's whole foods. And I'm sorry, but plant-based meats are not whole food. <laughs> They're very processed, yeah. salty, fatty sometimes at times as well, and can actually um, not be as beneficial. It is a, it is a, in some ways a good alternative though, in transitioning to a more whole food plant-based diet. So I, I recommend it for transitioning. Yeah. yeah, these are processed foods, and this is something that all uh, nutritionists are recommending that uh, the the closer to nature nature to to original stage whatever you eat 
the healthier it will be. Mm -hmm. All right, there is another question that uh, maybe you have a minute or two to share. Sure. Um, no, we didn't really emphasize salt, but yes, uh, salt use um, and substitute. I'm guessing substitute salt is what you're talking about using uh, uh, uh there are there are a lot of substitutes for salt so we all at this point we know that biggest issue with salt is high blood pressure right um your your blood pressure can rise to the degree of salt intake and so it is very important to watch out for watch your salt intake and this is a thing i get from most of my patients they say oh well, i don't add any salts to my food <laughs> right you probably heard that arena i don't eat any i don't add any salt but they don't know that most of our packaged foods you know, have salt in them. And that's why when you're eating whole food, plant-based foods in its most natural state, you're actually naturally eliminating salts. Um, I don't yeah, have a lot and, of... When, Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, and when you cook at home, you know how much of salt or whatever else you added there mm -hmm. and what kind of salt. So... Um, because, yes, it, so you can control how much you use. But you can use alternatives. Like, I think there's Mrs. It's called Miss Dash or Miss Dash. Yes, um, seasoning. Yeah. I like to use yeast flakes. You know, yeast flakes is actually has a kind of salty flavor. Um, but there's yeah. a lot of substitutes on the market that don't use, um, use as much sodium in it. Um, so, or there's some that have more chloride than sodium. So you might want to mm -hmm. do like a more a higher chloride than sodium percentage. So, yeah. So. And and I also experienced it and also heard from uh, nutritionists who specialize on spices mm -hmm. sometimes we can add more spices to our Excellent. food and you don't need that much salt because what salt adds it emphasizes the flavor of whatever you have right so if you add some uh, good spice some herbs that uh, may actually enhance the flavor of whatever you have in your uh, cooking very good point yep i like that so um whoever is watching if you have questions please don't hesitate to type them because this is your opportunity okay all right here is the question interesting question what if you don't want to give up me all right i, I know i was good. i always get that question right and so <laughs> Um, I'll give two answers. I guess there's, there's so many ways to answer that, right? So obviously, the for me, the 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 highest point of health, right, is a diet that that doesn't include meat. However, for a lot of people, that's an option that they don't feel as realistic. So the point of the fact, the matter is, the more whole foods you include in your diet, naturally, you're gonna eat less meat. The um the problem with our most of our our traditional dishes is that they have too much meat. So eat more. Don't focus on how eliminating it out of your diet. Try to have maybe you want to start with what they call meatless meatless Mondays or something, right? You know, try to experiment with more vegetarian or whole I should say whole food meals, right? Um, uh, so your focus should be increasing the whole foods, right? And eventually, you probably start to crowd out some of that meat. You're not going to eat as much naturally um, in your diet. Mm. In blue zones around the world, it's um, it's not all or nothing either. There's a lot of people who are living very long with very, but they only eat meat on occasion, maybe um, a, a couple times a month, right? So it doesn't. It's not all or nothing. It's not like, well, I can't go full vegetarian, so I might as well just chow down on this meat, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not all or nothing. It's not all or nothing. And I would also say, unless you have another question I want to speak on, you know, there's it's a transition. A lot of people tell me they would never be, you know, whole food, plant-based. And then they tried it. They said, you know what, I'm going to go three weeks and challenge myself. You know, I'm not going to go step by step. I'm going to go all the way. And a lot of people do that if they really embrace it. Just give yourself maybe a three-week challenge. You feel so good that you don't want to go back. So it's like one of those things, proof is in the pudding, but it's not all or nothing. Yes, yes. And uh, I just, you know, something that I um, like to, to remind, we you mentioned it, like back then in the cave age, people did eat vegetables and they did eat meat, but they ate meat only yeah. when the man went out he and, and caught you know, the mastodon <laughs> you know yeah and and they ate it as because they didn't have ways to save it preserve it so they ate it for that. whatever time yeah. and then until the next mammoth will cross the path 
they were staying on vegetables, vegetables. and seeds and roots. So exactly. uh, it's something that we need to remind ourselves. Yes, we have those molars that uh, that could you know grind the meat, but we also have the other yeah. uh, opportunities. Exactly. You know? <laughs> and that's why I always mention that that you know it was until the 1940s, 1950s when our food production changed and meat became yeah. more readily available that we also saw a rise in these diseases. It shows you it's yeah. unnatural to be eating meat and animal products every day. It's not a part of yeah. our the natural design. Yeah. Yes. All right. And and refrigerators become uh, the staple in every yes, household. Yes, you can see, key store it for later, right? Yeah. Okay, here's another question. Oh, wow. That's a good question. This is the only way to reverse diabetes going plant-based. Now, um, that's a very good question. So there's all the ways. So all, other alternatives that people uh, recommend are the keto diet or low-carb diet. Now, the problem, if you're asking me, you know, to compare one to the other, why I feel that the whole food plant-based diet is better is because if you consider it, consider this, if you stop eating... I always use this analogy and I hope it makes sense. If you have a peanut allergy and I tell you to reverse your peanut allergy, stop eating peanuts, Irina. Mm -hmm. Did you reverse your, your peanut allergy? Oh, I definitely will stop eating peanuts. I don't want to. Exactly. My allergy will stay, allergy will but stay. I will not eat uh, peanuts to, so I will not uh, trigger it. So that's one alternative approach. I know that I have a problem with glucose or carbs, so I limit carbs. That's the main approach, but it's not really reversing the disease because the moment you eat carbs, your blood sugar starts to rise, right? So the only yeah. way to eat the peanuts is to reverse the peanut allergy. And the only way to reverse that insulin resistance and make yourself tolerant to glucose in the same way in the analogy of uh, peanut, uh, tolerate to peanuts, right? Tolerant to peanuts. Um, is to reverse the cause. And this is the only way to reverse the cause. When you reverse the cause this way, then you can eat carbs, you know, um, in their whole state, you know, without problems. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just to cl clarify that you saying this is the choice for everybody has to make their the choice. choice. That, so, you got to choose what you want in life. And so, yes. you know, if you want, what you, you, can want what you can, right? And you can't have both because some people say, well, I'm going to continue eating my oily or fatty foods and I'm just going to increase my whole foods at the same time. You can do both because if your uh -huh. fat is high, fat percentage is high, you're not going to tolerate carbs. So it's either one or the other. Yeah. You know, bring the fat yeah, down. Well, carbs and fat do not go. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, they bring go the together down. very well, but they cause the, exactly. uh, the result that we have like, as we're trying if you, to. If you bring your fat down, you could eat your whole food carbs without a problem, right? You could start snacking on potatoes and rice and beans and and, and even fruit. I, this is crazy, Irina. Type 1 diabetics I see eating fruit for breakfast on this diet approach. Fruit for breakfast without spiking their blood sugars because their fat is low. So you can have one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, there is an interesting question. Uh, what is your favorite meal? Man, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously you're talking about whole food plant-based meals, right? Because I used to love me some chicken. Uh, everything. <laughs> but but now my favorite meals that I go to. Um, man, that's that's a good question. I like, see, I grew up as a, as a, um, uh, I'm, I should say I grew up as a Haitian. I'm, I'm Haitian. Right. And that's my, my, my culture. So we love rice and beans. <laughs> and, uh, so till today, nothing compares to good rice and beans. And, you know, and of course we, I, instead of the traditional, like parboiled white rice, I do quinoa or brown rice with my beans, but, um, yeah. And beans is a superfood, man. You can never get enough beans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, here's a comment like to follow your uh, saying that uh, you've seen type one having fruits for breakfast. What about mm -hmm. type two? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, unfortunately, I have only worked with type two diabetics at this point, right? But it's amazing that, yes, type two diabetics can't eat fruits without when they address the fat problem, the fat connection. Um, because again, what you're doing is you're bringing the sound, you, if you want to go back to the wall analogy, you're breaking that wall down, you're making it thinner so that 
the even fruit can go in without being trapped in the blood. It does take some time. And I should also say that it, you know, you might see a paradoxical rise. Let's say, man, Lewis told me to stop, you know, eating fat and I'm eating, I'm not eating much fat. I'm keeping that it down to 10% and my blood sugar is going up. Guess what? It doesn't happen overnight. So for some, it might just take a couple of days and their blood sugar start to go back down. For others, like my wife, it actually took a couple of weeks of her being consistent with the low fat approach. And now she could eat, you know, a, a lot more carbs. I mean, majority of my wife's food is from carbs, um, mm -hmm. including fruits. Yeah. So uh, what I, I hear is that, uh, yes, type two can eat fruits mm -hmm. after they brought their numbers under control. Control, yeah. After yeah. everything and it's, is and it's complicated. regulated. Yeah, and actually, it takes some patience because you you know as you're as you're getting your fat percentage down, you obviously got to eat something. You can't just mm -hmm. eat air, right? You know, yeah. so. Things, the food that's high in fat is also high in protein. So when you bring down your fat, you're also bringing down your protein. So you're going to eat more carbs. Yes. But be patient if you're truly keeping your fat percentage low. And that's why you can't really play around with this. You know, you got to you got to choose which way you want to go, right? If you're really going the whole food plant-based option and that's what you want to embrace, right? You can go you can go slow and steady, but know that it's going to take some time for your blood sugars to get down. The more change you make, the greater the effect. The more you embrace a whole food plant-based diet, the quicker the blood sugars are going to start dropping. Absolutely. Yep. Well, great. Louis, thank you very much for this information, for your time, for preparing this presentation. I hope our listeners learned a thing or two, took notes, um, at least started thinking about the possibility uh, uh we uh posted your um what where is it the the way how to connect with lewis oh, yeah. so uh these are the recipes and where is your contact information it's still the recipes. Uh, um sure. yeah we will find out uh and uh so to reach out, you could do that. He is one of the experts in our Facebook group. So that's uh, the, his first presentation. We will have more in the future. Um, you might want to re-watch our uh, recordings from the last, uh, last two um, Diabetic Healthcare Expos where Lewis was presenting actually last, uh, last Expo, he was doing a presentation on res insulin resistance. So uh, he will be around. Uh, we will be uh, connecting you if you need to. Or oh, here's his website. Uh, and with that, I think we should uh, start wrapping up. I wanted to remind everybody again that every other Wednesday we have the uh, support group meetings at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So our Facebook group, Diabetes 101 for Beginners, has the link to these meetings. Uh, the next meeting will be on October 11th. So you could um, attend this meeting to see how it goes. Uh, we uh, have next event, Diabetic Healthcare Expo, scheduled for December 2nd. Uh, we go for the whole six hours with presentations and roundtable discussions about life with diabetes and how you can help yourself to manage this diagnosis. And uh, again, um, thank you. Well, we need to say thank you to our sponsors uh, who are helping us to bring those events up. It's Mink Life Motivation on Balance Entertainment, Life-Based Solutions and Empower People Care. And with that, Luz, last something that what you would like to say, people, before we leave. Oh, oh one, okay. Well, one, my, my close off is always, beloved, I pray above all things that you may prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for watching. Thank you for sharing with your friends and family who needs to hear it. And we will see you next time. Keep your eyes on pinned posts in our Facebook group.